chapter 6 and verse 40. Hey, Luke. Luke. Can you give me a bottle of water? By the way, we really appreciate you writing this letter and preaching from the sermon notes from last year. I'm teasier than I'm funny, but teasier is kind of funny, right? Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. How many of you have your Bible with you? Raise your hand. Everybody, if you have your Bible, hold your hand up and do that. That's less than half. That's less than half. It's too late. The kingdom's come. All right, you can put your hand down. The point is, I would like you to bring your Bible. Do you know how people end up being deceived? They don't bring their Bible. That's one way. Because you don't know if I'm lying to you. I mean, really. There are, there are millions of people in America who are deceived by people who use the same book I'm using. How do you know I'm not lying to you? Because they're lying to some of their people. So you need to bring your Bible because your eternal soul weighs on whether or not you understand it and whether or not I'm preaching the truth to you. You understand that? The Bible says uh, that um, with, a, with the heart man believes unto salvation, but how can they hear? Or uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and how can they hear except uh, there be a preacher, and how can that preacher preach except he be sin? And so salvation only comes by hearing the word of God and someone preaching it, but I'm preaching the wrong thing. You can't be saved unless you hear from somebody else who's preaching the truth and you read the word of God for yourself. So it's a very important thing that you have your Bible with you. Amen? Amen. What we're talking about tonight is being a disciple, living for Jesus. Just a few announcements. Actually, one. That's really few. Um... November 15th, that's not this Friday, or it's not the next coming up Friday, but it's the Friday after that. Uh, we're having a fall youth fellowship. Uh, we're going to have it, uh, how many of y'all know who Noah and Lindsay are? Raise your hand. Okay, there are awesome young couple in our church. I've uh, been coming for a few months now. I've been saved for a little while. I love the Lord, sincere. They live in Karen Pro. They have probably, I don't know, two, three acres on their house, maybe four. I don't know. Terrible guessing acres. But they have uh, awesome house out in the country. They have a huge uh, carport under the back. They've got a big yard. Uh, we were there a few weeks ago for a leaders uh, thing, having uh, food and fellowship and hanging out. We had an awesome time. Uh, so we're having a fall youth uh, fellowship out there. We're going to have worship, word, keyword, food. Uh, we're going to have a yeah, all right, I'll um, We're going to have a campfire, fun games, things like that. Um, huh? Can't hear. Is it on? Is your mic plugged into the pack, right? Hello. Hello. There we go. Yay. Uh, it was on mute. Alright. So, do I have to re say all of that or did y'all get it? Yeah. Yeah. Y'all got enough? Y'all got enough to know what I'm talking about? Alright, we're having a full fellowship for the youth at Noah Lindsay's house. We already sent out an email. Your parents know about it. Maybe they told you, maybe they didn't. We're going to send out the address. But that's not next Friday, but Friday after that. So um, I want to encourage you to invite your friends, invite your family, um, you know, other teenagers, other people, youth, age. Normally I don't do that because honestly, what I'm more worried about is discipling you. You understand? I want to teach you the truth. If you're saved, I want to teach you God's word, disciple you. And, and get you the word of God rather than just making a large clique of a bunch of people to hang out your age. But I believe that uh, this will be a time for maybe some to get saved and give their life to the Lord. So I want to invite you to uh, to bring uh, friends, cousins, uh, people from school, whatever, invite people to come to that. And uh, I believe it will be a good time. So uh, as well, your parents are invited to come. I want to encourage you, you know, I'm telling you wrong, I said that out um, that's on the video now. I can't take it back. It's on the video that I called you out, Alex. That you didn't want your mom or your dad to be there. That I called you out, Alex. Oh, oh, this is going on YouTube. It does, seriously. It's terrible. 
Um, so, the Bible says you'll be judged for every idle word. You didn't know it would be by your parents, though, right? Um, so, I want to invite you to invite, I want to ask you to invite your parents. I want your parents to come, uh, to be there, to be able to fellowship with you, to see how you act around other people of uh, your age, and, and to just get them involved and to care and to, to be with you there. So, I want you to do that if you could, all right? So come to the right part I'm expecting. Uh, I'm expecting an awesome time uh, and to have a good time. So uh, we're going to do that. So that's our only um, that's our only announcement that I said we had a few of. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get into the message. Uh, let me. Does somebody want to stand up and read loudly uh, the text that we're using? <laughs> One of the youth. Anybody? Are you serious? Mackenzie. The text means, when you're texting, it means you're writing something out. The text is, I don't know the technical word. It's the passage we're reading. That's what I mean when I say the text. All right, so it's the text. All right, Mackenzie, will you read it loudly? All right, so Luke chapter 6, verse 40. That was a very good job, very loud. Um, I'll read it to you again. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And so what we're talking about tonight is being a disciple and living for Jesus. Amen. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. I just want to sanctify our hearts, sanctify this time uh, that God would come and touch our hearts. Amen. God, I thank you for these that are here. God, I thank you. That many of these, Lord, have committed their life to you. They've committed their life to follow you, to know you, to serve you. Many of them fit the mold that we're talking about tonight. That they are a disciple. They are someone who has committed their life to you, to know you, to follow you, to believe you. God, I ask you that you would come and you would open their eyes. That you would enlighten them, my God. That you would help me to preach your word with all of the truth and all of the fervor that it deserves, God, and that you would open their eyes and their ears to understand and to receive these truths, that they may walk in it, Lord. God, we are in an hour that is desperate for disciples. Lord, you have chosen to use disciples of Jesus Christ to impact this world with the gospel. You've not chosen any other method, Lord. You've hung all of that weight and all of that responsibility to be a light to the world, to win the world, to be a revelation of God in the earth. You've hung all of that on your disciples. God, it's so imperative, so important, God, that we get this, that we understand it, and that we walk in it, God. And I ask you, Lord, that you would bring that understanding to my heart, to the heart of these that are here, and that you would help us to do it and live in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Being a disciple is living for Jesus. A disciple literally is a learner, a student. By implication, they're an apprentice or a trainee. If someone has committed themselves to the teaching of another, this person has decided he wants to learn what his teacher or master desires to teach him. In the biblical sense, this is much more than learning in a detached, merely educational way. It is to make your teacher's lesson the absolute rule of your life. To follow Jesus, quote, as a disciple meant more than accepting the things that he said, but to give yourself totally to the teacher. This is shown in the way that Jesus in, I believe, chapter 6, asked people, or maybe it was chapter 9, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do the things that I say? You're claiming that I am your teacher, that I'm your master, that I'm the one that is discipling you. You say you're a disciple of me, and yet you don't live the things that I'm saying. You don't do the things that I'm saying. So a disciple is more than just a student who carries books. And Because, I mean, you can testify. Some of you, you carry the same geology or geography or biography books or whatever. I don't know, biology books, whatever. I don't know. See, I'm not a student. You carry the same books as everybody else. But you got terrible failing grades. Just because you're carrying a book and going to the class doesn't mean you're learning anything. 
But here's the important thing. Learning is not enough. That's not the point of being a New Testament disciple. A New Testament disciple is not someone who just learns facts and can memorize it, but someone who lives by that rule. It's not anything like math or spelling or grammar or anything else. Because, I mean, really, it's important to know those things, but convicts and, and criminals and drug addicts and alcoholics can have good grammar. They can do math really well. Actually, a lot of guys that go to college think that they do math better if they're high. So you, you can't just say it's important to just know the material. It's, it's got to be something that you live. It's got to be a way that shapes the way that you live your life. So it is to give your very life to Him. To accept Him as your highest authority. So much so that your identity is swallowed up into His identity. So completely that you become like Him. Let's read that text again. Chapter 6, verse 40. The second part. But everyone who is perfectly trained will be like His teacher. The purpose of being a disciple is to be like Jesus. You understand? Jesus wasn't just teaching things for people to acknowledge them as true and to go away unchanged. He meant for people to make what he was saying their rule of life. The way that they lived, the way that they acted, the way that they treated their family, all of their agendas to be based on that. So at the end of it, they come out looking like Jesus. I believe the King James says that the ones who are perfect the word perfect means fully equipped or complete or fully equipped, fully completed. Something that's been furnished all of the way. And so if you've been fully furnished as a disciple, if you get to the end goal of being a disciple, it's so that you can look like Jesus. It's so that you can live like Jesus and be as he is. Actually, there's a text in John that says it's a scripture in John. I don't want to say text. I don't know. There's a scripture in John. That says, as he is, so are we in this world. Because he has given us not only his teachings, but his heart and his nature. That he said he's going to live inside of us and give us his heart and his life to live in us, to make us like Jesus. So that we can be like Jesus. Jesus said that I am the light of the world. But then in another place, he says, you are the light of the world. How in the world can he be the light of the world and you be the, be the light of the world? Because he is that light and he abides in you. And he wants you to be that light. He wants you to represent him and to be just like him and to live after him in the same manner that he lived. None of Jesus' teachings were about hypothetical, irrelevant things. They were always about things that affected the way people live and how they see God. Indeed, Jesus was concerned about the weightier things. Jesus reproved some of the, the religious people of his day because he said, you weren't concerned with the weightier matters of the law. You were just worried about teaching and whether or not angels do this or that and whether or not there's a resurrection and, and whether or not this or that or can you do this or can you do that thing and just worried about stupid little things that didn't really matter. And Jesus said, you forgot the things that affect life. That's what he meant by the way it matters. He said, you're spending 9, 10, 14 hours a day reading, trying to make, understand what that word in Genesis chapter 6 means when it talks about the Nephilim. Is that talking about angels or is that talking about uh, giants or is that talking about what? And all of that is fine, but when you're spending 14 hours a day trying to argue over one little thing and the world goes to hell, what good is it? What good is it to say you're a disciple if you don't have love? If you don't have peace, if you're not having righteousness flow out of your life and you don't look like Jesus. That's the big point is so that you look like Jesus. And Jesus is concerned about the weightier matters, the more important matters. Look up something. Find something in the Gospels and bring it to me next week at you that isn't an important, relevant thing for the way that people live or the way that they view God. Find Jesus talk, just talking about stupid philosophical things. He didn't do it. He wasn't like Dr. Phil or Oprah sitting on TV just trying to impress people with big words. And you go, wow, that was amazing. It really meant nothing. You get all the way around that big huge thought they have. And, I mean, they can be sitting there talking to someone bound to drugs and alcohol and, and sin and lust and all of these things. And 
they'll give them this amazing psychological explanation and analysis, and at the end of it, they're still addicted to drugs. Because that's all that man has is vain philosophy and stupidity. But God doesn't have that. He deals with the heart. And he wants you to look like him. That's the point of being a disciple. Any idea that you have about Jesus that doesn't really affect the serious matters of your heart and life is not a biblical idea about who he really is. One way of describing discipleship is to use the term to follow him. When Jesus used this term in his earthly ministry, he literally meant to leave your current station and follow him wherever he went and to hear his teachings and to serve him. Since Jesus is no longer physically present in the earth, but his command to follow him is still in effect, this means something different, something even more important. Jesus Christ is the truth of discipleship, and to be a disciple is to live in that reality. That he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he wants you to have that way, and that truth, and that life. He wants you to live the way that he lived, to be the example that he was to this world. Jesus said, you ask me, let us show, show us the Father, let us see the Father. And he said, have I been with you so long? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I'm telling you, if Jesus is living inside of your life, people ought to be able to see God in you. People ought to be able to say, that's not their peace. That's not their joy. That's not their love. That's not their commitment. That's not their way of life. It has to be something from another world. It has to be something completely different. Last night, me and my wife were on our way home from a Bible study in Karen Grove. And I didn't do this just so I could pull this out as a great, you know, ha ha, this is a good example of what I'm talking about. Last night, me and my wife are on our way home, coming home from Karen Grove. We get on Turlings. And all of a sudden, I see this young man standing on the sidewalk, waving like this. And my natural thought is, ha <laughs> not a chance. Not a chance. Stupid, what's wrong with you? Wave me down. And I'm thinking, my natural mind is thinking, I got my wife in the car, I got my six-month-old, and I got my two-year-old in the car. Not a chance. Bub, you can get in my car. I ain't slowing down. I ain't even slowing down for you. And then the Holy Ghost convicted my heart because we had just been talking about after we left Karen for or before we left Karen for Nathan asked us about that passage in Matthew 25 that says on the day of judgment he will judge those and he will say to them uh, you never fed me when I was hungry you never clothed me when I was naked you didn't visit me when I was in prison you didn't help me when I was destitute and I needed you and they'll say Lord when did we do that to you? When did we see you and leave you and neglect you and not help you and not care for you? He said, when you didn't do it to the least of these. And we were literally talking about that passage when I see that young man standing on the side of the road and the Holy Ghost smoked my heart and said, are you going to love him? Are you going to take care of him? I just read the other day Hebrews where it says to take care of strangers for some by doing this have entertained angels unaware. That you look through the Old Testament and you see men of God having people come over. They take care of them. They help them. They think they're just a stranger traveling down the road. And then they help them and they look up and they vanish and they're gone. And they didn't realize that they were angels. And they were helping take care of them. And so me and my wife stopped and I looked at this young man. I said, hey man, how you doing? What's going on? He said, what road am I? He said, what city am I in? I thought, oh Lord, okay, he needs help. He doesn't even know what city he's in. We tell him where he's at. Where he's at. He asked if we can give him a run to such and such a place. I didn't want to do it. I'm thinking there's no way. And I thought, okay, Lord, this is you. I just, I felt like the Lord was leading us to do that. Just ask my wife, you get in the back seat, I'll have him up in the front. Because I don't want him in the back where I can't see him. So he can sit in the front seat. So Dave, you get in the back. He gets in the car. We drive him all the way to where he's going. He doesn't have a cell phone. He's taking us to a place he hasn't been in 10 years to see a friend and be able to stay the night with him. This young man moved all the way from Missouri to here to get a job. They let him work for a week, and then when it was time to give him his paycheck, dropped him off in the interstate without a paycheck or a cell phone. And so we're taking him to this house he hasn't been to in 10 years, get there, and nobody's there. And we're feeling like the Lord's laying this young man in our path for an opportunity to minister to him. And I'm thinking, there ain't no way this dude's staying in my house. There ain't no way. The Holy Spirit dealt with my heart again. I said, okay, Lord. 
That young man got back. I said, all right, let's go. He left a note on the door with his phone, my phone number on it. We took him to my house. We let him take a bath in our shower, gave him some food, let him sleep in our bed. And we prayed. I prayed all night long, Lord, don't let this fool be crazy. Don't let him do that. And, but we believe the Lord gave us that opportunity. And through that, we were able to share the gospel with him. We were able to give him the good news of Jesus Christ. And he kept saying, are you sure? Are you sure? I can't. I can't expect you to give me money. I can't expect you to do this thing. I can't expect you to do He was so blown away. And I'm going, brother, you got to thank God. Because this is not my heart. <laughs> I didn't say that. And I, want, I wanted to be a witness. I want to say, it's all right, brother. The Lord's blessed us and taken care of us. We want to help take care of somebody else. I'm trying to give God glory. And I'm really thinking, if I would really give the Lord glory, I'll tell you, my heart was saying, dude, you better get out of my house. <laughs> but it was the love of the Lord. Because it wasn't me. Because I can't take credit for that. Because if it was me, I can't even tell you. So, yeah. anyway, so praise the Lord. So I am going to show you a picture later. I had a redneck alarm system. We shut the door, bedroom door, locked it, had the kids in there with us, and I set cans and pots and pans up against the door. So if you tried to come in, I'd hear it the middle of the night. I've got my back. <laughs> so, so we were, we had faith, but we were also smart. That's right. God gave you wisdom. And so just knowing that we ought to be living in a way that bears witness to the love of God and the nature of God in us. You realize that? We ought to be living in a way that testifies to the world something's different about that man. Jesus wants representatives in the earth. You know what the Bible calls us who have the gospel? And that can even be you. is ambassadors for the kingdom of God. You know what an ambassador is? The king can't go to every country. If the king of England wants to go somewhere, he can't always go to every place he's visited. So he'll delegate to that man his authority, tell him his will, and send him out to other places to represent him in other countries. Well, the Bible says that we have a country that's not of this world, and God is in the Holy Ghost to live inside of us, that we can go out and represent the kingdom of God be testimonies of God in this world. And so God wants ambassadors. That's what it is to be a disciple. I want to ask you one way, because we want to define what a disciple is, because many of you have no clue what a disciple is. One way of understanding what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to understand, understand what kind of teacher he was. So the message is, what did his disciples call him? They called him the Christ, meaning he is Savior. And so if you're going to be a disciple, he's got to be your savior. He's got to be the one that's saving you from your sins, forgiving you of your sins, bringing you into covenant relationship with God so that you can be right with God. He is the Christ, the one that died for your sins. That's what kind of teacher he was. As well, he was a rabbi or a master. It literally means a teacher. And this word is used 41 times in the gospel when speaking about Jesus. And so Jesus was a teacher, and he didn't teach with weakness. He taught with authority, and he did things with authority. So he was a teacher, a master. Another word they called him is Lord, meaning one who has authority and the owner of something. Is he your Lord? Because Jesus acted like a Lord. Jesus didn't go around asking people to do anything. Did you see Jesus asking Peter to do anything? You know what Jesus told Peter? Peter, go. You see Peter protesting anywhere? God, I don't think that's fair. I'm tired. I've been preaching all day. I handed 5,000 people a piece of bread and fish. And you're going to tell me to go. Go do this. You know what he said? Yes, Lord. You're my Lord. You know what they did? Jesus came out there one day after they'd been fishing all night long. Wore out. You may think it's not that heavy. You just throw a net over but then you got to pull it back in through the water. And you got to sort through the fish you don't want and throw them out. you got to throw it out again and pull it back in. Try that for 8, 9, 10, 14 hours a night. And they come up with nothing and be exhausted. And so they're exhausted. They're tired. They're coming back in. They're, fought, they're dreaming about rest and sleep and just oh, catching up on sleep. And Jesus comes out there, probably slept a good night's sleep all night long. Probably rested, came up looking refreshed. They said, hey guys, I'm exhausted. Alright. Hey, y'all want to launch back out into the deep? Spend 45 minutes rowing back out into the water? 
And then once you get out there, throw your net on the other side. So they had things. You know what Peter said? We told all night long and didn't catch anything. But at your word, we will do it. He was Lord. Is he your Lord? Is he the one that leads you and guides you and directs you and commands you and has authority over your life? He's also the Son of God, is what Peter called him. It's also what Thomas called him. So he was the Almighty Creator. Let me ask you, what did they think of him? It says in several passages that they marveled at him. It even says in some passages that they feared him at times with reverence because he was different than them because he was God. And so he showed up and did things that showed them he was God and they were in fear and they shrunk back and they were timid and said, oh God, we didn't know what we were getting into. We bit off a little more than we could chew. Because you think this is just, Jesus looked like a normal God. I mean, you think Jesus walked around glowing, floating everywhere and they would have still crucified him? He looked just like a normal, everyday man. They slept with in the same campfire with Jesus. They slept the same place he slept. They saw him eat. They saw him doing natural human things. And it's easy just to think he's a normal guy. He's a normal guy. Oh my Lord, there's a thick cloud coming around. He's talking to two dead prophets. And he, he, all of a sudden his clothes look like they're glistening white. And he's transfigured till his face looks like the sun. And what's called the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, I forgot I need to be a little more reverent toward this Jesus. I forgot I need to be a little more understanding that he's not a normal man. He's God. And so there was a reverence and awe of fear. I think another big thing to understand this is how did Jesus treat his disciples? Because Pastor Kenny uses a phrase that kind of, when we were in Bible class, it hurt a little bit. But it was a good hurt. It was true. And the same thing can be used of a servant and a disciple, because really they're one and the same thing. In several places, Jesus uses the word servant and disciple interchangeably. But there's a phrase that says, you'll know if you're really a servant by how you act when you're treated like one. Because in church world, we like to go, I'm a servant. I'm humble. I serve. I do nice things. Yeah, I help people. That's right. I cleaned up that break room after y'all left it a mess after you. I mean, I'm, I'm not bitter. It's all right. Um, you know, I'm not the we did. You know, can shakes for uh, almost a year. We did this and we did that. I'm a servant. But you let somebody come and talk to you like a servant. You let somebody come and tell you what to do or disrespect you in front of people or talk to you in a way that humbles you. I'm taking that. I'm stand up for myself. Servants don't do that. You know what servants did? Shut their mouth. They were quiet. That's right. You don't like that. You said, hey, I heard him. That's right. That's right. Because you need a home serve. You need a heart. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is able to bear reproach. Jesus said, if a man strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek also. And we downplay that and put all kind of other little excuses around that. Well, he meant if you did this when that happened and that. They didn't really mean that. Trust me. What did Jesus do? They hit him in the face and said, Prophet, prophesy to us. Who hit you in the face? Didn't open his mouth. Shut his mouth. That's what Jesus did. And you know what Jesus said? If you're really a disciple, you'll be like your teacher. Is he teaching you? Is he giving you his heart and his nature? And is the way that he acted and the way that his heart is in heaven, is that how you act? Is that your heart? So how did Jesus treat his disciples? He called them to follow him, Luke 14 and 26. He did this with authority, and he commanded them. He called them to leave everything they knew and everything that they treasured behind them. This included careers and the family business, their fathers, their wives, their children, their homes, and their comfort because they were sleeping outside most nights. He called them. As well, he taught them. In Matthew 5, 1, it says that he taught them, and he wasn't just teaching them, he was teaching them the way that they should live their life. Remember what he said? Blessed are the poor in spirit. He didn't just dance around the issue and say, you can live however you want. Just acknowledge these few little truths. He said, no, be poor in spirit. Be brokenhearted. Be persecuted for my name's sake. So he taught his disciples. He commanded them in Acts 1 and 4. Let me ask you, is Jesus allowed to com command you to do anything? What if Jesus commanded you? And I'm serious. I, I really want you to pay attention. I want you to listen. I'm very serious. What if you lay in bed tonight, you prayed, you sought the Lord, and at one moment God said to you, 
I want you to never be married so that you can serve me with your own heart. You realize he did that to people. He did it to Paul. Paul said that God had given him the gift of singleness so that he could be single, so that he could better and more fully serve the Lord without being distracted. Because he said in 1 Corinthians 7 that the married man is mindful of the things of his world because he's got to take care of his wife, so he's got to work, he's got to provide for his family, he's got to do. I'm married, I got two kids. It's a responsibility. And sometimes it's hard to balance between I'm spending too much time sending an email on my phone when I should be loving my wife and I spend a little too much time watching a movie with my wife when I should have been praying for somebody or, or studying the Word of God. And so many times there's this conflict. And so what if God commanded you and said to you tonight, I want you to commit yourself to me in a way that you'll never marry so that you can serve me better. What if, what if you got the job you finally waited for for years like I did. Get the job. You're finally making money. You're almost topped out on what you can make. And you feel like you're doing good. You're secure. And you're going to be doing that for 30, 40 years until you can retire. And then I'll go into full-time ministry. And I'm seeking the Lord one night. And God says, quit it. Sell everything and leave. Wow. Really, Lord? Because I just, I just, I'm the, I'm, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I was best operator in that soul man. Running everything. Managers love me. Bosses love me. I could run just about anything in there and do most of it better than most of them in there. I was working hard, working fast, getting promises of money and all of these things. And God says, no, nope, go hand in a resignation and leave. And move to Baton Rouge and go to college, which I was terrified of. <laughs> and not only that, he told me to leave Casa before we were married, when I wanted to marry her. And I was ready to marry her. I was ready to commit myself, ready to be with her. He said, nope, leave. Really, Lord? And you know what? Some of the disciples came to Jesus with this self-righteous attitude, and Jesus was talking about the cost of following him, and they wanted to prove that we are following him. And they said, Lord, Lord, we, we've left all to follow you. We've left houses and home and land and wives and children and family and friends and all of these things to serve you and to follow you. Jesus said, don't be self-righteous. He said, no man has left anything for my sake that he won't receive a hundred times more in this life and in the next. But are you willing to count that cost? Can Jesus say to you, do the impossible? Because I tell you what, it's easy to say it, it's easy to preach it, but I've had a few times, say a few times, there have been several times where God put my heart to the test. God did just what we were talking about that song a few weeks ago about laying your eyes down, about God giving you something precious, and then God the Holy Ghost coming to my heart and saying, Son, are you going to hold that back for me? Or are you going to lay it down? What if I take it from you? What if I snatch it from you? Because God gave Abraham an opportunity to lay what was precious to him down. He gave him warning. He let him know when Abraham got to make a decision about this. Job didn't get to make a decision about anything. God allowed the devil to go to him and murder his family and burn his crops and pull his house down and to turn his wife against him. God didn't give him an option. God allowed him to be struck with sickness till his whole body was covered in boils and sores. And he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of what if you don't get to lay it down? What if it gets violently snatched from you? And tears with it. Tears corners of your heart. We don't just get to calmly and smoothly, like taking off something and just being very precise, precise and gentle so it doesn't hurt. And it's just snatched off. And chunks of his emotion and his heart and his mind were ruined and broken. What if God says, I'm going to let that happen to you. I'm going to let the, everything that's precious to him be burned to the ground. What's your heart in that? What about you? What about Mackenzie? Everything precious destroyed, gone in a day. What about you, Jackson? What you going to do? If you even know that it's the Lord, because they, 
Job said the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He knew that it was God that allowed the devil to do this. And even though it was the devil that did all these things, it was God that allowed him. And he said the Lord snatched these things from my life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him because he's good and he's worthy. He commanded his disciples. He didn't ask them anything. God doesn't ask. God tells. God commands. God speaks and expects us to obey. He rebuked them at times. Mark 8, 33. His disciples, he rebuked them. He didn't just let them slide on everything. Because some of you, if the Lord would rebuke you, you would harden your heart and hide from it. You would refuse to receive it. And honestly, if someone else who's supposed to be discipling you rebuked you. Do you understand that God uses other people? Because after he was raised from the dead, and he was getting ready to send them all out. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. And so if you're making disciples, who are they disciples of? The one making disciples. And if his disciples are like him, then we're supposed to do what Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy. He said, Timothy, man of God, rebuke, reprove, and exhort. We all like that exhort part. Encourage. Hey, my brother, I see you've been serving the Lord well. You were praying a lot last week, and I just want to thank you for that. But what about rebuking? What about when a pastor or your parent or a brother in the Lord that goes to school with you and you feel like, who is he to rebuke me? Who is he to say these kind of things to me? But Jesus rebuked. Disciples have to be able to accept correction. Jesus many times would come to his disciples and they were supposed to be doing something he commanded them to do. An act of faith, maybe several times it was casting out a devil. And they came to Jesus and said, Lord, we couldn't cast him out. And he said, oh, you will faith. He didn't just say, hey guys, I'm sorry. He just didn't have enough faith. It's okay next time. Because sometimes a parent knows teaching is good, correction is good, but sometimes you need it to sting a little bit to really get the point. And so he rebuked him. You have little faith. I'm God and I walk next to you and I told you to go do this and yet you still struggle to believe me. That's not acceptable. It's not okay. And God would say to some of you tonight, if your heart was peeled back and everything in your heart, all of the agendas and all of the other things were peeled back and all the things that cover up those things and were all exposed and you sat down suggestive about these things, he would say, I despise that. I hate it. It's an idol. He placed it before me and I don't want it gone. Not that he's mean and cruel, but he's righteous and he's just. And God always has the appropriate emotions at the appropriate time. See, I'm not like that all the time. Ask my wife. You're not like that all the time. See, sometimes you need encouraging or exhorting but I, I feel like you can right now. I'm bad. And so we'll, re, we'll rebuke when we should exhort. Or we'll, what I'm usually guilty of is exhorting when I should rebuke. Because I don't like offending people, making people feel bad. And I don't like confrontation. And usually I'll just kind of try to encourage and gently nudge in the right way. And I've sensed at times the presence of the Spirit of God hit me upside the head. He was not exhorting. He was rebuking. You're being weak right now. It's time to rebuke. So are you able to receive a rebuke from the Lord? Because Jesus rebuked. And to be with Jesus, you had to be able to get rebuked. You had to be able to have somebody point out your sin bluntly to your face so that you could deal with it. It's not just to make you feel bad, but it's so that you can take that sin, that shortcoming, that immaturity, take it to the altar, be broken over it, and let the Lord change you and make you who you want to be. So he rebuked them. That's his authority. That's his position. But it's not all like that. See, because some people would just say, not enough people preach on that, so we're just going to harp on it. Rah, rah, you should, you're mean and you're stupid, you're wrong, and we just want to rebuke all the time. But Jesus wasn't just like that. He also loved them, John 15 and 9. 
In John 15, 15, he called them friends. He said, you're no longer servants because servants don't know anything that's going on in their house. But I've told you everything, and that only happens to friends. And so you're my friend. He calls us his friends as his disciples. He laid down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. He said, no greater love has any man known than this, than that he laid down his life for his friends. And he said, I have called you friends. So Jesus laid down his life for you because he's your friend. Does that make you want to obey him? I mean, that's not a guilt trip. Doesn't that endear you to him? Doesn't that pull on your heart and say, man, I should, I should love this man. I should obey this man and follow this man. When he could have just squashed me like a bug because I'm guilty and sinful, he loved me and he called me a wicked, sinful man, his friend, and laid down his life for me. So he laid down his life for his friends. He fed them. I like that one. Matthew 14 and 21, he fed the 5,000. He had, it says in Matthew 14, 14, that he had compassion on them and healed all that were sick. Jesus has compassion on you. And if you're a disciple, you will get that compassion. God will pour that compassion out on you. And some of you know what it's like to be in moments of desperation where you need compassion. Where you need someone who can be sympathetic towards you and understand the weakness and the brokenness. And it says in Hebrews chapter 4 that we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our, our infirmities. But he was at all points tested as we are. And so he can be sympathetic to the weak, to the broken, to the hurting, to those who are wounded and understand our brokenness. As well, turn with me real quick. John chapter 13. I just want you to see this. John chapter 13. And verse 4. I want to set the stage a little bit. Jesus, this was at the, the last supper. Jesus had just broke bread. He just shared with them. He broke the bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. He passed them the cup. And he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the blood of the covenant. Take it and drink of it. And so he just shared it with them that he was going to die for their sins. And listen to what he does. John 13, verse 4. He rose up from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. This is something that a servant would do. This is something that a slave would do. Whoever was the lowest of all of the slaves, when someone had dirty feet, whoever was the lowest of the slaves, the poorest, the brokenest, the lowest on the totem pole, to use American terminology, is that servant would take off his clothes, except his under, undergarments, wrap himself in a towel so that he wouldn't be naked, and he would humble himself before the people. And he said, and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So the towel that he was wearing, he washed their feet. God washed the feet of men. Did you get that? God washed men's feet. If I asked one of you to wash someone's feet, if they had clean feet, and they just got out of the shower, and I asked you to get down, put your, their foot in your hand and wash their feet, you would say there's no possible way. That's, disgusting. That's gross. God did that. To men with dirty feet. Fishermen's feet. You ain't seen nasty feet. You've seen fishermen's feet. I'm just saying, worse than new new. Worse than new. I'm talking about like jacked up, gnarly toe, uh, messed up, scabbed up, crusted. Stop. Stop. Jesus, God, about to die for them, he said, you know what? It's not enough that I'm going to die for them. I'm going to humble myself as a servant and I'm going to wash their feet. That's your Jesus. That's the one that speaks with authority. 
That's the one that makes callings and calls you. That's the one that commands you. That's the one that leads you and teaches you. That's the one that's rebuking you. And that love ought to show you, I ought to be able to take this from him because he loves me. I ought to be able to take this from him because I know he's given himself for me. So he washed their feet. As well, I want you to know this because this is very, very important to whether or not you're a disciple. Did you know that Jesus limits who can become his disciples? It's not for anybody and everybody. It's not just up for grabs. Like whoever comes to it first can be a disciple. Jesus limits who can become a disciple. Luke 14, 26 says, If any man comes to me and hates not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be, he cannot be, he cannot be my disciple. Now I want to explain to you that I believe my understanding of this passage is it's what's called a hyperbole. It's a big word meaning to exaggerate, to get a point across. Because we know that Jesus in other places commanded that we love one another. And even in 1 John chapter 2, it says that if we say we love God, whom we've not seen, we don't see our brother, and he's talking about brothers here, who we've not seen, how can we love God whom we've not seen? And so I don't believe he's saying that you literally have to hate your brother, but he's saying that you have to so love God and commit yourself to God, it's as though you despise them. If you would keep me back from serving God, I despise that, and I so love him, I'm willing to leave. And so he's saying, your devotion to me must be greater than father or mother or son or daughter or friends or school or anything else. And if it's not, you can't be my disciple. Luke 14, 27, and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you're not willing to accept death to your own self, your own nature, your own agenda, and follow Christ, you cannot be his disciple. If you want to lead and guide and live your own life, you can't be his disciple. You can't be his. It's an ultimatum. You have to choose one or the other. Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has cannot be my disciple. Whoever is willing to put anything in front of me can't be mine. They're not welcome at the school of Christ. They're not welcome at his school if you're not willing to lay down everything to follow him. Jesus expects the full devotion of those who would receive him and be his. He won't allow people to come to him just to get what they want out of him without fully committing themselves to him as Lord and Savior. Turn with me to Matthew 26. This is our last place that we're going. I want to explain this to you. Some people would debate this, but I believe it's true. That to be a disciple is synonymous with being saved. Some people would say, you can be saved without being a disciple. Because not everyone's going to commit their life to following Jesus and knowing Jesus. And they use this term, uh, they receive Jesus as their Savior but not as their Lord. And I don't believe that that's possible. I believe that to be saved is to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that to be a disciple, you have to submit your life to the Lord. And some evidence for this is that in Acts 20, Paul uses the term disciples in a synonymous way for the Christian church. And so to be a Christian is to be a disciple, and therefore to be a Christian is of necessity to be a disciple. You have to be a disciple. So when it says, if you're not willing to leave everything for me, you can't be my disciple, he's saying you can't be saved. Because if you're holding to the flesh and self and pride and sin and your own life and your own way, you cannot be His. You must be completely committed to the Lord Jesus Christ or not at all. Jesus won't accept a halfway commitment. You understand that the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be His bride. 
And I would have never married my wife had she have told me, Honey, I want to be your wife. I want to love you. I want to have your children. I want to live with you. I'm even willing to move with you to Louisiana. But I want to have other men on the side. Which one of you girls would have enough audacity to say that to a young man? Which one of you young men would be willing to accept that from any girl? Jackson, would you accept that? Would you be able to accept that? To share devotions? To have to share those affections? To have to share that commitment? Nor will the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not accept that. But yes, I still want me as my God. I want to be God, but I want you to be Savior. I want to rule and reign and live my own life and dictate where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to live, and I don't want to be rebuked, corrected, chastised, redirected, commanded, or anything else. I want to be Lord of my life, but you be Savior of my life. And Jesus says, I won't have it. Either I'm your Lord or I'm your nothing. Either I'm your Savior and your Lord, or I'm the one that's going to throw you into a lake of fire for eternity. You choose. I believe that that's the gospel. So the one thing I want to minister to you last is that Jesus asked his disciples to do things that are impossible for the natural man. I want you to know this, that being a disciple is not an easy thing. It's not a weekend commitment. It's not some small thing. It's impossible for the natural man. You understand that? You can't do it in your own strength. So Matthew 26, verse 40. This is after the, the Last Supper. Jesus has gone to what's called the Garden of Gethsemane. This is literally maybe an hour or so before Jesus is betrayed and taken captive to be crucified. This is an intense hour for Jesus Christ. And so Jesus leads these people. He leads his disciples to that garden. And it says... That he asked his disciples, he said, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. So Peter, James, John, you need to be praying so that you're not tempted to, to leave me and desert me. You need to be praying so that you're not tempted to go a wrong way. But it says that he came back. This is verse 40. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? You couldn't pray for one hour. I just told you, I'm about to die. I'm going to be murdered for you. And you couldn't stay awake for one hour to pray? You serious? And it's for your sake. I'm telling you, if you don't pray, if you don't hear from God, and you're not getting strength from God, if you're not talking to God and hearing from Him so that He can lead you and guide you, you're going to fall into temptation. And you can't take that seriously for an hour. Listen to what he says. Verse 41. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Listen to the words that he says. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's saying you have the heart to do it. When I tell you, watch and pray, you're willing. Your heart says, I want to, I desire to, I'm ready to, I'm going to do it, Lord. But you keep failing because you're in the flesh. You're not receiving any grace to do it. You're not receiving the power of God to do what He's called you to do because you're trying to do it in your own strength. And so it's impossible for the natural man to do what he's supposed to do. And for some of you that you want to serve the Lord, you want to follow the Lord, the Lord is giving you tasks and responsibilities and things to do for Him. But you feel like you can't do it. You feel like you're too weak. You don't have the strength. You keep failing. You keep messing up. I'm telling you, you're in the flesh. You're doing it by your own power and it won't work. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciples, you have to have the Spirit of God empowering you to do it because I'm going to ask impossible things for you. This is what I want you to know. Jesus is not going to set the bar low so that you can reach it. He's not going to say, I'm going to give you the task that you can do with only a little bit of help from me. I'm not going to give you the task that you only need me to help in just a little bit. He said, I'm going to give you the things that are impossible for the flesh. Actually, I'm talking about people fall asleep, and I'm looking at two of them right now, but I fall asleep. Somebody needs grace. Amen. So wake up. 
Because the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. So wake up, get, get the spirit so that you can do it. So what I'm telling you is if you're not receiving the grace of the Lord to be strengthened and empowered, you're going to fail. So what you need to do, if you're going to be a disciple, you need to be receiving the power of God because God's going to ask you to do things that are tiring. You understand? The Spirit of God leads you to do hard things. Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God fell on him, and he didn't just have to sit there at the river going, we're going to have camp meeting because the Spirit of God fell on me. It said the Spirit of the Lord drove him into the wilderness to fast 40 days and nights. That would kill a man who doesn't have the power of God. That's too hard. You didn't hear Jesus say, sorry, Holy Spirit, that's too hard. Lead me somewhere easier. Lead me to do something I can do in my own strength. He was willing to say, Lord, I don't care if it's impossible. You're driving me in this. You're leading me to do it. And I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm overwhelmed. I'm emotionally stressed out. But I'm willing to receive the power of God to do what you've called me to do. And so I'm asking you, young people, I'm asking you that you would seek the Lord to empower you to be a disciple. To give you the strength to do what he's called you to do. One of the things that Jesus commanded his disciples is he preached the gospel. He told them, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. But wait until you're filled with the Holy Ghost so that you have the power to do it. Because I'm certain many people are willing to go and preach the gospel. And I know people. I can think of one right now that has gone and he's gone to another country to go serve. And he's failing. He's been there. He's got all these things going on. And I'm saying, I'm thinking of my heart, brother, you're not full of the Spirit of God. Not because he's failing, because sometimes the Lord allows us to go through hardship. But I know this young man. And he's always giving himself, I want to be an evangelist. I want to, be a, I want to do these things. I want to do this. And he's not going, first of all, led of the Spirit of God. And he's not going full of the Spirit of God. And so plenty of people are willing to do what God's calling them to do, but they won't receive the power to do it. And God says, be filled with the Spirit of God. Receive the Spirit of God and the power of God to do what God's calling you to do. And so to be a disciple means things are going to be hard. Things are going to be difficult. It's going to test your emotions. It's going to test your, your mind. It's going to test your heart. You realize there are some people that for discipleship's sake, and for the sake of serving God, have nearly been driven insane. You realize that David, one of the servants of God, led of the Spirit of God, filled with the Spirit of God, doing God's work, was so desperate, and God allowed him to be in such a desperate place that he almost went insane. So much so that he went to this foreign place and went and he knew, okay, these people are going to kill me. It was Gath. It was the place that Goliath was from. All y'all know the story. David and Goliath. Well, Goliath was from a city called Gath. And then David ends up so persecuted, the only place left to go is Gath. And he knows, okay, these people are going to kill me because I killed him. And then I sent my men to kill his four brothers. And he's going to treat me real nice. And so you know what he does? This king, David, goes to the city and to keep from being killed, acts crazy. He goes outside of their gate and scratches on the gate and begins to let his drool run down on his beard so he looks insane. And the king of the city goes, is this King David? Is this the man anointed by God? Is this the guy that killed Goliath? Goliath was killed by a guy that needs to be in the cuckoo's nest? And he was driven nearly out of his mind by following God. It's not easy. Elijah following God, serving God, doing what God called him to do. And then the persecution got so hot, he went, got alone with God in the cave, and God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And God, Elijah said, it's enough. Kill me. Take my life. I want divinely assisted suicide. I don't want to kill myself, so God, can you do it? Because I'm scared and tired right now. You're, it's, it's emotionally, mentally, physically racking my body. Kill me. Anybody in the line to be a disciple now? Anybody saying, I want Jesus to command me to do things that are impossible for the flesh? Because that's what it means to be a disciple. 
If Jesus says you can't be a disciple unless you're willing to forsake all and follow me and do whatever I say and let me be your Lord, I'm telling you there are people in this church that think they're a disciple that when the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ comes, they'll still be sitting here and having church in this church without God. There are people in this church that think they're okay with God and they're going to die and stand before God. And God's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And so I'm telling you, it's a hard thing to be a disciple. But Jesus is a good teacher. He's a good Lord. He's a good Christ. He's a good Savior. He's a good God. And He loves you. And this Jesus is willing to wash your feet, to love you, to encourage you, to bless you, to have compassion on you, and to heal all. So don't let that hardness be a stumbling block to you. But let the Lord deal with your heart. Amen? Amen. 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 Pray with me. God, I thank you for these that are here. God, my heart is heavy, Lord, because I know that I've spoken heavy words, hard words, difficult words. And I pray that I've not overstated myself, Lord. I pray that you have guarded my heart and my mind and my mouth, that I say nothing that would bring offense to your word. But God, the truth of the reality that so many people quickly call themselves a disciple, even myself, Lord, with a haphazard, insincere attitude, when you don't take it as a light thing. I ask you, Lord, that you would open the eyes of these that are here, that they would see the seriousness and severity of that call, and they would do what Jesus warned, that they would count the cost, because it would be embarrassing to have begun this work, but have not had enough commitment to God to see it all the way through. God, I ask you that you would turn the hearts of these here to you, to know you, to follow you, to serve you, and that nothing would distract from it, God, and that these here would be the testimony and the wisdom and the witness of God to this world by the grace of God. I thank you for it, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. 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 So we're going to have that time of, of question and answer, and I just want to ask you all for serious, if you have any serious questions, um, we finished about average time, um, so it would be good to finish a little bit early uh, so that y'all can uh, eat and go home to fellowship and do all that, because I know y'all tired and some of y'all basketball guys are falling asleep right here. So, I know, I didn't run all day, so I'm real tired. So, but I want to ask, does anybody have, alright, hey guys, pay attention real quick, does anybody have any serious questions, any questions on discipleship or just anything we talked about tonight? Give him a minute, Dad. Then. Right. So you said that something that the other Jesus had to say is really calling us all of our kids and say, you know, you said something like that, right? Well, say you, what? He reiterated, he said, uh, people who are called about all of our being made for the translation. Well, I'll say this. It's not. This is what I do want to, to reiterate. And I do. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Is because in saying that, we have to be careful because there's no such thing as perfect repentance. And there's no such thing as uh, work salvation. You don't earn your salvation by being a good person. The point is, God wants to be Lord of your life, and He deserves that. And so what He says is, if I can't have your heart, I can't clean your heart. Do you understand that? So when the disciples preached the kingdom of God, they preached repentance. To turn from sin and self to turn to God. And so the, the idea is that to be a disciple means to submit yourself in your life to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means being willing to hear what he says and serve him. Okay. So, does that explain it? Yeah. So, okay, that brings up another question. Yeah. So, like, you know, I know people who are saved, you know, but, you know, they don't really live their life, but, like, they hide from God and yell at you, you know, like, they show you what's up. But, yeah, I guess it kind of gets really, really sad about a person. You're asking? They don't surrender completely, but they are. Are you, are you asking if there's a contradiction there, or are you asking yeah. if they're really not saved? Yeah, yeah. What yeah. would be the yeah. outcome? I'll say this. Imperfection is different than not submitting to the Lord. You see the disciples 
Many times Jesus rebuking Peter when he has a wrong idea, but you see that same idea carried for a while that Peter, okay, you're, you're self-sufficient. You think you're strong in your own strength. You think you're okay. And you're, you're, you're never going to deny me. I'll never deny you, but you are going to deny me. And he still says, I'll never deny you. Um, so the Lord works with our weakness, our imperfections, and our flesh. Because you even have, uh, I believe we talked about Nicodemus, um, or not Nicodemus, what was the one that uh, he allowed Jesus to be buried in his grave? Um, huh? Joseph of Arimathea, okay. Um, I knew it was more full than that. I was like, not Joseph. Yes, Joseph. Um, but you see that it said that he was secretly a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you would say, was there a contradiction there? Because Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. But John acknowledges that he was a disciple and he wasn't fully confessing and revealing. Not that he was denying Jesus, but he wasn't confessing Jesus publicly. And so at those points, we have to let God judge. And some of those cases, they're just not born again, they're just not saved. And some of them, God's got to deal with them and, and put his finger on that issue and say, this isn't pleasing to me, it needs to come out. Um, and so this is, this is why... Jesus said we don't get to be the, the ones that make that final decision about who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Because sometimes we're going to be surprised. Like we're going to get to heaven and like, how did he get here? What in the world? And then there's going to be some people like, how did they not get here? They were the most amazing, righteous, all of these things. And God says, I never even knew them. They weren't even born of the Spirit of God. And so we can in inspect fruit and do those types of things. But Jesus talked about the wheat and the tares, and he said, uh, the servants, meaning the disciples, said, where did these tares come from? Do you want us to go and tear them up? And he said, no, 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 no. You're going to end up tearing up wheat with tares. Because sometimes tares look like wheat, and that's why it's deceptive. And so it's not your place. He said on the day of judgment that angels will come and separate those things out. They, they will be more specific um, and able to judge rightly. So not our place to judge. Does that answer, or is that still kind of confusing? Jenny?
Yeah. There's a there's a, a pass a few passages where uh, we talked about last uh, Sunday where Jesus said, "Come follow me." And they said, "Okay, Lord, I'll do it." But first, let me go bury my father. First, let me go say goodbye. And he said, "If you want to do that, you're not worthy." Of me. And and just before that, he told one guy, "Come and follow me," and he wouldn't. And so with with Matthew, James, John, Thomas, Philip, those being specifically the twelve disciples, we see that before Jesus called them, he was calling them for that specific purpose of being those twelve disciples. And so we see that he prayed all night and heard from the Lord, and God the Holy Spirit showed him and led him to the right people so that he knew, okay, this person's gonna come follow me, come follow me. The guy gets up and follows him, and it's what's called for obedient grace that God had already been dealing with his heart, God had already been ministering to him, showing him something's wrong, something's all these things, and I believe that God had stirred in him a desire to be, Lord, I'm tired of the way I'm living. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I'm looking for that Christ that you promised, and then just then, Jesus comes up and says, hey, follow me. Oh, you came today. I'm ready. God up and left. Um, and same thing with, with the disciples that Jesus gave them a, a miracle of fishermen, and he said, I'll make you a fisher, a fisher of men come and follow me. They drop their nets. Their family business that they probably, every generation of their family for years has been in that fishing business, and they left their father in the nets and the boats and went and followed Jesus. Um, so it is, it is a awesome thing. Jenny. Um, I know that was a lot of people that were like, well, Y'all guys pray for Brother Richard. I heard that his mother passed away. So pray for him. Um, I just want to talk to Brother Richard. He's fine. He, he, he's good. Uh, he wasn't sudden. Uh, I mean, sudden when it happened, but he was expecting her yeah. to do because uh, she fell and broke some ribs. So uh, he's okay, but they need that piece with her. I'm sure he's still heavy as long as far as his spine goes. But um, he's good right now. He's up this morning. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anybody else have a question? So somebody, give me a definition of what it is to be a disciple. Lane. A follower of Christ. That's a good, good. Gavin. A servant of his teacher. A servant, that's good, because we talked about that, how Jesus used uh, the word servant and disciple uh, interchangeably at times. Then, and then someone conforms to the way of someone else, and they, they make they not only hear their teaching and accept them, but they make them their way of life. So, what was that one? A learner, a pupil, a student. Gavin? A role model to their teacher. Huh? A role model to their teacher. A role model to their teacher? You mean a role model? Like of their teacher, like they represent that teacher. Amen. 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 So, all right, all right. That's good. That's a good. That's a good point that we talked about. How the pupil represents the teacher. They got them, and and the the pupil, the learner, the disciple should be a picture of that uh, that teacher and represent him before people. Amen. So let me ask you. Somebody describe Jesus as the disciple maker. What does that mean? What does it mean to be the disciple maker? Because you have someone who's a disciple of the teacher, the disciple maker. What does that mean? What is Jesus when we call him? uh, We're his disciples. Lane. Okay. That's good. Ben. Master. They call him master. Who are we to Jesus? No, who is Jesus to us? We as his disciples. Mackenzie. He's our teacher. Yes, he's our Amen. Amen. So that's good. Let me ask you, what is the requirement to be a disciple of Jesus? Oladapo. Obedience. Obedience? Good work. Man, I should have made that my whole message. Just obedience. <laughs> Amen. Lane. You took yours? Yes. Awesome. Give me one from the girls. I've had most of the guys. 
What, what's required to be a disciple? Hallelujah. Y'all heard that? Hey, listen. One more time. Share it again. <laughs> Amen. Y'all remember that? I want you to think about that when you're reading through the Gospels. And you notice Jesus didn't ask the disciples to do anything. Jesus told the disciples, go into Jerusalem. There's going to be a donkey. You get that donkey. You go and you follow the man with a picture of water until you find a room. It's already been prepared for you. Are you serious? I'm supposed to go into a city with no money and grab a donkey that I don't even own and see a guy who's carrying a water picture and I'm going to go, okay, there's a guy with a jug of water. I'm not supposed to be able to follow him. And then I'm going to follow him. We're going to get to his house and then all of a sudden he's going to have a room prepared upstairs with dinner ready for us to have the last supper at. And then they do it and he, and he blessed them and he did it. What about, let me ask you this. If you were Peter... And you're going with Jesus into the temple, and they say, okay, you got to pay a temple tax. It's this much money. And say, we ain't got no money. And Jesus told you, go get a line and a hook with no bait, throw it into the water. You're going to catch a fish. It's going to have money in its mouth, and it's going to be the perfect amount to pay for what we need. How many of you would have went to the test with a fishing pole with no bait on it and threw it in the water? You would have went and said, look, I'll cut some grass for 50 bucks, man. <laughs> Somebody. Like, I got a fishing pole right here. I don't want a fishing pole. Give me a lot more than $50. I'll cut your grass. That's what it is. Jesus commanded them to do what to them seemed like stupid things. But you know how much their faith was built? You know, Peter's been a fisherman his whole life. And he had to think, this is the dumbest thing anybody's ever said. But to pull that fish out of the water, you know what his heart did? When he pulled that fish out, he said, I can't believe this fish did the hook with nothing on it. And he opened that fish's mouth, and he found money in it. You know what his heart did? I bet you, I guarantee you, that big old burly, strong, bad dude fell on his knees in front of everybody and said, God, I'll never doubt you. God, you're so faithful. You know everything. You are the wisest most wonderful, powerful person I've ever come in contact with. How in the world can you use me for this? Because trust me, some of the things that I've said to the Lord, i got to do this? I have to do this? Lord, make them do that. And then I get through it, and God blesses it, and use me in it, and I get down and go, God, I'm so glad you let me be the one to do that. Because only you could have the testimony, and I get to be the one to say, God, use me for that. And it's just a wonderful thing. So it's good to be a disciple. It's exciting to be a disciple. Because some of y'all would never do anything exciting or dangerous or out of the way. And Jesus sent me to India. You know how hard it was for to get me to Louisiana? It wasn't easy. The Lord got me to Louisiana. To India, there is no way unless the Spirit of the Lord led me there. And it was such an amazing blessing to be there. So it's an exciting, wonderful thing to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that God would just minister that to your heart, that you would receive the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would learn of Him, and so that you could be just what we talked about, Luke 6, that the one who's been fully trained will be like his teacher. Amen? You got a question? Oh, you was moving hand. All right. No, you got to do them on the spot. Give me a Greek study, Greek word study. Give me one Greek word and an explanation of it. Almost used to it. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Amen. He said, I'm a C, C student. Amen. All right, Jack, I didn't give you a chance to ask a question. What you got? If you don't get a good question, the candy bar I promised you last week is gone. Turn to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fall on his mercy and be so compassionate. Still turn to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because the grace of God is able to sustain you. That's what Paul told, or what Jesus told Paul. Paul said, Lord, this is too much. I need, I need deliverance from it. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. And so if anybody's turned from him, turn back to him and believe that he'll be faithful, protect you, and God, he'll preserve you. You still have the candy bar. Hey, Amen. No, one. Hey, don't make promises on my behalf. All right, so we can go ahead and uh, and have dinner, have some food.
So y'all be ready for uh, two weeks from now, the 15th, Fall Youth Fellowship. That was almost cool.